So we're going to talk a little bit about lighting up the darkness today. And uh, has anybody ever said to you, do you have a light? When people say that to me, I say, yes, I do, shining in my heart so brightly. And it's for the Lord of glory. Hallelujah. Praise his name. Let's talk about him for a few minutes. And then they look at me and go, no. Um, but hopefully you have a light. Hopefully you have a light in your life. And uh, Jesus, when he came, he lit up the darkness. Amen. The world was full of darkness. The world still is full of darkness. And he still lights it up. It's number one. Jesus is light that overcomes the darkness and frees us to live in the light. Jesus is the light that overcomes the darkness and frees us to live in the light. I want to read John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. And uh, it says, In the beginning the Word already existed. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The interesting thing about Christ is he is the word of God. He is the creator. All things are created by him. It's amazing to think that a creator would become a part of his creation in order to redeem them. Just like the clip we watched earlier in worship, it, it blows our minds. I have a friend who's a, uh, a radio show host, and uh, he does a live radio show every day in uh, South Dakota. And every Christmas Eve, he always reads the same story. And it's about, it's about a farmer who takes a bird who's got a nest in a dangerous place, and he moves the nest, and it tries to save the bird, but the bird keeps going back and making the nest in that one place where uh, the baby's going to get killed, and the bird's going to get killed if, if it doesn't quit doing that. And he gets frustrated, and he says to himself, man, no matter how many times I move this, that bird just keeps building that nest back there. If only I could find a way to go into that nest or, or to become a bird so that I could talk to that bird... So I go, and the bird would go, but he said there was a way I could become a bird and speak the bird language and tell them, the reason I'm doing this is because it's not safe. You need to understand. You need to build your house somewhere else. This is not a good place for you. And then as he was thinking about that, he thought to himself, wait a minute, that's, that's what God did for us. He came into the realm of human history. He, he walked amongst us. He told us, hey, wait a minute, no, no, no. What you got there, boys, is religion. And that ain't going to help you. You need a relationship with me. He showed us how to walk, showed us how to live, and even became a sacrifice. When the world rejected him. So it's amazing to think that the God of all creation stepped into human flesh. Verse 2 says, He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. No matter how bad the darkness gets, just keep this in mind, it can never extinguish the light of Christ. The world lives today in a lot of darkness, and it can be kind of a scary place sometimes. God sent a man, John the Baptist, formerly John the Methodist, but he had some problems there. So. No, John the Baptist... 
to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everything, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. Now, before Jesus came, there was an incident with Moses and uh, the glory of God. When he stepped off the mountain, a lot of people believe that his, we were just talking about this with the worship team the other night. A lot of people believe that when he stepped off the mountain, his hair turned completely white. Because he'd been in the presence of God. If you've seen the movie, what they believe is that he got a perm while he was up there on the mountain. Because <laughs> he built up a straight hair. He comes, I have seen God. And they go, curly, nice. <laughs> that is very good. Um, but the glory of God, after Moses had been with, with God, was so bright that the people begged him, we can't take it. You're, you're too shiny, too happy. So Moses put a veil over his face to cover the glory of God. Now God had instructed him to do that. That was to accommodate the people. But one of the problems that happened when, when when Christ came into the world was that to his own people there was still a veil over their faces, over their eyes, from seeing the glory of God in him. The chief priests of the time and the Pharisees and Sadducees, they could not recognize that this was God in flesh. As a matter of fact, more than once they called him Satan. They said, you cast out demons because you're the enemy and you have authority over them. They made some horrible accusations towards him. They could not see that he was Christ. And part of the reason they could not see that he was Christ was because of that veil. Think, wow, that's, that's quite a curse to have to bear. They should have never asked Moses to conceal the glory of God. And so... We see that they didn't recognize him. Verse 11, he came to his own people and even they rejected him. They didn't just not recognize him. They rejected him. We're not going to listen to him. We're not going to go where God's going. We're, we've got tradition, tradition. And this guy was like, he was messing up. Oh yeah, he couldn't have been Jewish, a good Jew. He let his disciples eat without washing their hands. No, that's a sin. He let his disciples, he let his disciples eat stuff on Sabbath. They could pick from the week. He healed on Sabbath. When his disciples entered a building, they didn't take off their caps. Okay, maybe that's well, that one's not in the Bible. But they looked at him and they judged him by all these different things and said. There's no way that he could be a real teacher. He's, he's leading people astray. And a lot of the judgment wasn't coming from. They weren't judging Jesus because of all the things that they were trying to check him off on the law. They were judging because they were jealous of him. Because when Jesus talked, people would listen. And when they talked, nobody would listen to him. So, they rejected him. They gave him over to Pilate to be crucified. Verse 12 says, But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn. Not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. You see, we're born into this world. We're born through the water. When a woman's pregnant and the baby's about to come, what happens? Her water breaks. 
had a little baby, and we're like, ah, ah, you know, hopefully. Hopefully you come out crying. If you came out talking, that would be weird. <laughs> Wouldn't that be weird if the baby came out and just had speech? Take the baby to Dr. Spanks and be like, why are you doing that to me? Good night, man. Don't be down. We have a bathroom around here. <laughs> but we, 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 we have these, we have these, these, these things that we don't always realize. We're, we're, we're human. We're born to humans. We come out human. We're little babies. We're helpless when we come out. We can't help ourselves. We can't even hold our own heads up. It's just a miracle. You know, it's a miracle that you're here today. It's a miracle that you're alive. Think of all the things that could have happened from the time you were born that could have wiped you out. And yet you're still here. There's nobody that can say, I was an accident. Because you know what? God has a plan for each and every single one of us. God gave us, he gives us life and it's a precious gift. But Jesus gives us another gift. He reconciles us with God. Because one of the things that happens is, and the Bible says all of us sin and fall short of the glory of God. We, we don't always do the things that we're supposed to do. We walk in disobedience. We, we make mistakes. We, we intentionally sometimes even do things on purpose that we know are wrong. Because of that, this thing called sin came in and it severed us from the presence of a holy God. It kept us apart from Him. We couldn't, we couldn't have a relationship with Him because of the guilt of our own sin. And it's really something that animals couldn't take care of. For years and years and years, Israel sacrificed, but it couldn't cover the sins. Something we can't take care of ourselves. No matter how hard we try to be righteous and we try to be good, man, I'm going to be perfect. I'm going to do everything perfect today, man. I'm going to, oh man, I just messed up. Because that happens. We can't be perfect. The only thing that can reconcile us to God was God himself sending himself as a sacrifice. Fully human, fully divine, taking our place and giving us access to God. So when we come before God, after accepting Christ, after accepting what he did for us, when we come before God, he no longer sees the sin but the blood of Christ comes. And now instead of being reprobates who are far from God, we're sons and daughters, we're children again. He came to reconcile us to God so that we could be the sons of God once again. So, verse 14 says, The Word became human and made His home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. We have seen His glory and the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Can you imagine that? Seeing the glory of God. I, 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 wish, I wish I could go back and be it. It's not Jesus. But I wish I could go back and, and just walk with Him, talk with Him. And I know some people that have had visions of Christ and visions of Him in the Holy Land and, and, and seeing things. And it's just, wow, I, just, I would love to see that with my own eyes. Just to, wouldn't it be awesome just to have like 10 minutes with Jesus? And then I'd be like, this was awesome, Lord, but I don't understand your name. <laughs> <laughs> But it'd just be, I mean, it would just be awesome to go back and just to, just to know. And here's a sad thing. 
before his death and resurrection, his disciples didn't know. Well, they knew he was special, and they knew he was the Messiah. They thought he was going to set up a literal kingdom. But I don't know if they understood that this was God in flesh in front of them. Because that would have changed some things. And so, I just, I, it just blows my mind to think that here this wonderful Savior, this, this light, the God of all creation, came down to reveal himself to us, to walk with us and talk with us. But he didn't just do it solely to reveal himself. He did it to redeem us, to bring us back to Him so that we have a calling now. Number two, we have a calling to shine the light of Christ into the world. We have a calling to shine the light of Christ into the world. It's like homage friendship bread. What a terrible gift to give someone. Because when you get it, then it just, you know, if you do it right, it multiplies, then you've got to find another person to give it to, and another person to give it to. It just never ends. But that was God's intention for us, was to give us this redemption, this peace, this hope, this light, this faith, so that we could take it and light up the darkness. So that we could take it and give it to those who are in need. So when we find somebody hurting and suffering, we can say, hey, can I pray for you? So when we find somebody who's depressed and, and they're way down in that place, my dad used to call them Molly Bros. I don't even know what that is. But when they get there, we can say, hey, you know what? There's hope. There's a light. So when, we be, when, we, when we see people suffering and hurting and people who are perplexed, we can offer them some answers and Shed some light on their darkness. Matthew 5, 13 through 16 says, You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You know, the thing about salt is, that, that's kind of weird. Things are either not salty enough, or sometimes they get way too salty. The other day we were at Walmart. Have you ever been there? <laughs> Everybody's there when I go. <laughs> I hate it. We try to avoid Walmart like the plague on the weekends. Especially Saturday. Because everybody's got the kids in the car going, rah, 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 grabbing everything off the shelf. But we were at Walmart and we were down the cookie aisle one of my favorite guys. And we were looking at, at those uh, oh, Pepperidge Farm little bite packs. And Nicole saw this cookie. It said uh, Salted Caramel Milano. I think, that, I think that, something like that. She's like, oh, I gotta have that back down. <laughs> so we put that in the cart. We're like checking out. Well, a couple nights later, Nicole said, Oh, I'm going to go get that pack of cookies. And so she opened it. She started eating a couple. And she was back. <laughs> and I said, What's going on? She said, That's nasty. I was like, Girl, you're blasting me now. I've never tasted a nasty cookie in my life. <laughs> so I grabbed, I grabbed one of those cookies out of the sack and I bit it. Oh. <laughs> Something was really wrong with that cookie. It was supposed to be salted caramel, but it was like caramel salt. It was, it was like taking some salt, shaking it out, just like licking it. It just, oh, it was awful. And I said, well, we're done with those cookies. But I guess the, you know, why is he telling us this story? <laughs> well, if he knew, he'd probably get to the point, right? Um, my point is this. 
If salt loses its flavor, it's worthless. But at the same time, if we get too salty, we're horrible tasting. You know, there's a lot of Christians that get so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. And, and just like, well, if I met a stranger in the mall and decided I was going to speak in tongues to them, <laughs> uh, might not work out very well. Of course, I've been to the Rock, Rock Springs Mall, and there's probably some people who would be perfectly fine with that over there. But, but in the same way, if I God speak everything, and I used to call this stuff God talk. When people are always peppering and salting their, oh, praise God, hallelujah, glory to Jesus, how are you today, praise God. It's like, why are you making me decode what you're saying? Every fifth word is an actual statement. Everything else is just Jesus gibberish. We've got to be careful that we're not too salty. Because that turns people up. One of the things Christians try to do, sometimes they try to be too salty when they're having a horrible day. Oh, just praise God. Everything's going to be okay. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> just say I'm having a horrible day. You know, 90% of the time when somebody tells you they're fine, they're not. <laughs> Fine's a word we usually hide behind. If I come to your house and you offer me a Coke and I say, I'm fine, that means, yes, I'd love a Coke. <laughs> I am dying of thirst. Thank you. But we do that. Sometimes we get too salty. And we get so salty that we're not real. And what the world needs is they need that balance between, between us being the salt of the earth. And, you know, you put the right amount of salt in something, bam. It's wonderful. Too little? Need some seasoning. Too much, we're going to spit it out. So we have to have that. We have to have that discernment that comes from the Holy Spirit to know how to how to live our life and how to how to be salty, but not too salty. Jesus said, "You're the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hid." Well, you see a city on a hill, you know where it's at. Matter of fact, I've been to some places where. There were, there were hilltop cities where you're driving and it looks like you're just coming into that city and it might still be miles away just because of the lights. You can't hide that. No one, puts, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. Don't be ashamed of Jesus. Don't be ashamed. You know, we're in a season right now that I know that some of the origins and the roots and the timing aren't quite biblical, but it's still an opportunity to share the light of Christ with people. It's still an opportunity to tell them who Jesus is and what he's about and take them from the manger to the cross. And so don't, don't be ashamed. Don't hide what God has given you. It says in the same way that you put a, a, a lamp on a stand to light the house, in the same way let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise who? Your Heavenly Father. Things that we do are to glorify God. They're to bring Him glory. Hopefully, you know, everybody is, is going to forget stuff about us. Someday we might even be completely forgotten. But if we have a legacy of leading others to Christ. And somebody gets saved and they start leading somebody else to Christ. That's not going to be forgotten. That's going to be carried on. As preachers, they tell us at, at, at our district council and our growth seminars, they say most of what you say will be forgotten. And most of what you do will be forgotten. As a matter of fact, they say to preachers, when, when you leave a church, in a couple of months, people pretty much forget what you said and what you did. So the one thing that people remember is how you made them feel. A lot of times people don't remember what we say or what we do, but they remember how we make them feel. 
Let us be light. Let us be Christ to those who are hurting. Number three. If you want to be light, you have to get rid of darkness. If you want to be light, you have to get rid of darkness. That's, that's pretty much uh, pretty obvious. To be light, we've got to get rid of darkness. There's a lot of people who struggle with darkness. And, and one of the things that, that hinders them from, from sharing Christ or from, from walking with God is the fact that there's a lot of guilt because of darkness that they carry. And even though they've come to the cross and, and, and they've laid down their burdens and they've said, Lord, I want to be your servant, the enemy uses that darkness to keep them suppressed, to keep them quiet, to keep them quenched. And we have to trust in the light of Christ. Luke chapter 11, 33 through 36, which actually, we're going to reiterate some of the things that Jesus said before. No one lights a lamp and then hides it or puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where its light can be seen by all who enter the house. Your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. But when it's bad, blah, 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 your whole body is filled with darkness. Make sure that the light you think you have is not actually darkness. Isn't that a weird statement? Make sure that the light that you think you have isn't actually darkness. I believe what Jesus is telling them is he's telling them, don't be deceived. Don't trade religion for relationship. Amen. Don't think that the things that you do are what, what calibrates you into Christianity. And there's a lot of people who, who do think that. They think that by their works, they're going to earn their salvation. They're going to they're help others by, by doing work in front of others. Here's the thing. I've been in ministry long enough to know something. My first church, I thought that I could change people. And all I did was frustrate people. And I'd hear things from somebody, and I'd go up to somebody's house and go, blah, 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 blah. and I couldn't understand why they weren't overjoyed with me. Yeah. The thing was, it wasn't until... I got uh, knee deep in my own doings <laughs> that I realized only the Holy Spirit can change people. You'll knock yourself out trying to change people and you'll get disappointed every time until you just surrender them to Christ and shine light. The Holy Spirit can change people. God can change people's hearts. We can't. And sometimes we try and it just frustrates us. Yeah, we get ourselves frustrated. We get people frustrated. The biggest impact you can have on somebody's life isn't necessarily confronting them. As much as it's behind the scenes, just praying for them. See, I'm going to tell you the way that the, 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 the Lord works and the way that religion works. Religion is like a spouse in a house who's telling you stuff, but you've tuned him or her out because you really don't want to listen. And the Holy Spirit works like this. The Holy Spirit whispers something into your heart, and all of a sudden you go, this is what I need to do. And then all of a sudden you talk to the spouse in the house. And they're like, oh, I told you you needed to do that three weeks ago. <laughs> but here's, here, here's the true fact, and this is why this happens. If you're married, you know what I'm talking about. You might tell your wife something, or your wife might tell you something, and, and after a while, you just kind of tune it out. And then you, go, you get this heavy, you know what we need to do? We need to do this, this, and this. And she's like, I don't need that. 
you should never listen to me. Then the argument becomes a never listen to me argument. But we're all that way as humans. And I'm going to tell you why. Because we all have seasons. Some of us have big seasons, some of us have little seasons. But there is a right time and a wrong time to approach someone or talk to someone. And only the Holy Spirit knows those times. And one of the problems that we have sometimes, somebody will get approached about something when it's not the right time, the right season. For instance, you ladies, maybe you've got to go away and your husband needs to take care of your schedule the next day. He needs to pick up the kids at a certain time. He needs to drop off dry cleaning. He needs to go to the grocery store and pick this up and that up. The best time to talk to him is when he's snacking, lounging on the couch in front of a football game. And, and you're like, well, maybe I shouldn't. Oh, I'll just... You know, you need to get up tomorrow at 7 o'clock. And... Now, amazingly, that guy is very... He's a good listener. He's just going, yep, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, got it. Now, here's what's going to happen. Your kids are going to be abandoned. <laughs> Your dry cleaning's not going to get done. He's not going to go to the grocery store. You come home that night, there's going to be no kids in the house. There's going to be no clothes for you to wear. Nothing for anyone to eat. There's going to be guys sitting on the couch. Probably finishing up the same bag of chips he was on yesterday. And you're going to be, why didn't you do any of the stuff I asked you to? And that's what he's going to say. Why did you ask me to do that? <laughs> You never listen to me! He's like, I listen to you all the time. I'm listening to you right now. Hey, where are the kids? <laughs> See, there's times. There's times. There's times when you have to you have to make sure that somebody's engaged in that conversation or it's not gonna it's not gonna work. And and that's one of the things that we miss out sometimes on is the fact that we we get caught up in the wrong seasons. We get caught up in, in the wrong times, and because of it, we don't have the impact that we could have. People can be free from darkness, but only the Holy Spirit can free them from that darkness. Amen. Something God has to do. We can have compassion on them, we can love them, we can pray for them, we can shine a light. But here's the thing, even the Bible says, don't grow weary in your good doing. For in time, you'll reap a harvest. Don't give up on anybody, ever. Never give up on anybody. Because you know what? God is working. God is working. And he's using the things that you're doing. If, you, if you're laying down prayer for them, if, if you're lifting up Christ, God's using those things. But you just got to remember, there's times and there's seasons. And they might be in a very unresponsive season, but don't give up on them. Don't give up on them. Same way for you husbands and you wives. Don't give up on your spouse because they don't listen. None of us do. Um, but it's true. We all, uh, it's funny when you, when you talk to people with like, marriage counseling. Because everybody thinks, oh, that issue. We've got a terrible issue. And nobody else is going, everybody. 90% of the stuff that people throw at me is stuff that I might be going through myself. The other 10%, well, that stuff blows me away. But, uh, <laughs> but Jesus said, make sure that the light that you think you have is not actually darkness. Because the light that we need is not us, it's Him. Anything that's not Him is darkness. Anything that Troy Height does apart from Christ is useless. And if I think there's light in it, I'm fooling myself. And so 36 says, if you're filled with light and no dark corners, then your whole life will be radiant as though a floodlight 
We're filling you with light. We want to be radiant today. We want to be servants of God who are full of light. So my challenge to you today is this. You know, this is the Christmas season. This is a great time to shine a light because the world's more open to it than usual. Also, it's a time when a lot of people get depressed, you know. You can't help but think about the people that you love during this time that's passed on. And when the holidays come up, man, you miss them. It, it, it leaves a big hole in you and you hurt. So let's shine a light to one another and try to comfort some of the, that hurting that's going on, too. But let's use this season to spread light, to spread the love of Jesus. And if there's any darkness in us, ask the Lord to reveal your heart to you. And if there's anything that needs to be chipped away, if there's anything that needs to be pruned, just say, Jesus, I surrender that to you so that I can be a hundred thousand candle flashlight beaming out with your glory. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father God, in Jesus' name, I just thank you for this congregation. Lord, I thank you for every soul that's here. And Lord, I pray that we would shine your light. God, I pray that we would just light up this darkness with the light that you give us, God. That when people see us, they would see you. Father, that you might be glorified. And more than anything, I just thank you that you shine your light into this world. God, I can't imagine how dark it would be without Jesus. Lord, the darkness that exists in this world already is is my nothing. Lord, I pray that we would be your workers, that we would be your lights. And Lord, we would shine the light of Jesus into that darkness and change it. And I pray these things in Jesus' name.